Greetings again, in Jesus' name. I'd like to bring a premise up in this, this lesson about drawing near to God and comparing the scriptures with what is being taught and who's right and who isn't and what the consequences would be under either one of those. Let's think about that. In James it says in chapter 4, verses 4 through 10, he addresses the people as adulterer and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with God, with the world is enmity with God? He says, therefore, anybody who wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture speaks in vain that the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? See, see, he gives more grace. Therefore, he said, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So he doesn't give grace to the proud, okay? That, that's not what the scripture's saying. Now, he goes on in the caption, it says, Humility kill, cures worldliness. And he says, Therefore, submit to God and resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. you know, draw nigh unto God, as it said in the King James Version. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And lament and mourn, and let your laughter be turned into mourning, and your joy to gloom. And humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. You're talking about repentance, of course in this, about cleansing your, that self-cleansing time of humility and brokenness and repentance that purifies the heart, comes before that mercy seat. See, but it's not likely that the saved and sin crowd in the churches have ever heard this passage applied to them by their pastors. See, in the professed uh, world of salvation, where it's repeat after me, see, you're a sinner saved by grace. So the sinners spoken of in this verse have yet to be saved because they haven't done the routine yet. They haven't accepted the package, as some people would say. See, this passage speaks directly to the people that are presently committing adultery with the world, to the professed people. He's, he's, talking, he's, he's not talking to anybody else here. It's speaking directly to the professed people they're professing to have faith in God, but they're committing adultery with the world on a daily basis, and then proudly flaunting their sins in God's face as double-minded hypocrites who refuse to purify themselves in repentance and cleanse their sins like the prophet. He's, he's preaking like the old prophets here. Well, wash yourself, make yourself clean, amend the evil of your doings. See, they think sin humbles them, not a departure from it. See, that's what I have here. On the one side, humility and pure this brokenness will humble you, but see, they think sin humbles you. We'll show you exactly what sin does to you. So professing Christians today, they're living as a wretched, desperately wicked, chiefs of sinners. They hate to hear this message from the scriptures applied to their sinful conduct and their excuse-ridden lives. See, the pastors are happy to oblige them and all their other friends and, and uh, acquaintances in the churches and on the blogs because it's a happily ever after world in the church where anything goes. Just believe in Jesus and everything will be fine in the end. However, the Bible says, what the, if what the Bible says, now here's my premise, if the Bible, what the Bible says about sin and all the warnings is true, then the wretched and the double-minded sin everyday people living in la-la land are in dire straits with God, if that's the case. So let's make a quick comparison. Let's assume first if the repeat after me routine, it's valid and that none of this stuff applies and people can be justified in their sins, keep right on sinning without fear of further judgment and it just pie in the sky. So what do they really gain? Let's, let's compare. What do you gain then by that life? The average professed Christian, their lives are a colossal mess. They're in a constant state of repeated failure. Their relationships are full of contention and strifes and separations, divorce, abuse, damaged children, drunkenness, lust, perversions, all manner of uncleanness and that leads to further destruction of family and personal harmony, it gets people thrust in jail, loses their jobs, loses their livelihood. Just as Jeremiah said about these people, they cry, peace, peace, when there is no peace, like he said in Jeremiah 6, 14, and several other places. See, they live in a constant state of carnality, walking in the flesh, fulfilling their sexual desires, their sensual desires, self-seeking, 
confusion and bitterness and envy follow them, all proceeding out of their own desperately wicked hearts that they love to proclaim as their filthy rags to God, that's their salvation. Well, nice life, right? Very nice life. If that's all God has to offer, pie in the sky when you die, that's what they claim. Okay, well, that's the one side of the coin. Well, under the same premise, then, if it's all true, and we're doing all this in vain, living for God and purifying our hearts and guarding ourselves and walking in purity, what do we gain? What do we gain? Well, those of us that live right and fear God and depart from iniquity and keep our hearts pure, what do we lose by walking worthy of God? Our minds are renewed from the insanity of having to sin every day in thought, word, and deed and from all the other insanities that sin brings. Our hearts are made pure by obedience to the truth. Our conscience is clear before God and man. We cannot be charged with these things that we're not doing. We have genuine peace within our spirits, yielded to God, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy, like James chapter 3 talks about, the wisdom from above. We live in harmony with others. We love our neighbor as ourselves. We shun every appearance of evil. We focus our thoughts on things above and not on things of the earth. Our flesh is crucified with Christ, passions and desires thereof. Our lives are hidden with Christ in God. The word of God to us is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of our hearts, showing us the way, lighting our path. We contend earnestly for the faith because the love of God within us constrains us to do these things. And we do not rejoice in iniquity, but in the truth, like God's love. We are spared the horrible consequences that accompany this sinful life, this wretchedness. We live peaceably in the world gone mad with lust and upside down on its head. So we've lost nothing. We've lost nothing. Because there's really nothing of any lasting value in the world to gain. So if the Bible warnings are true, then we've gained a life of eternal bliss with God all by simply taking His Word at face value, obeying Him from our hearts, and doing what's right by faith working by love, and enduring to the end. Simple as it could be. Just obeying the Lord. So I say we gain that an eternal life, you, you say under this mess you're going to gain eternal life, but at least we have a life of harmony and peace now. You have a false peace in your sin. See, that's the contrast. What occupies the lives of the sin everyday people? It's just like James says in that passage. If you read that whole passage in chapter 4, he talks about where wars and fights come. Well, this is a, he, what is he alluding to there? Not a war that we go out and, and go against our enemy. No, this is fighting and struggling within yourself against the passions and the desires of your flesh-based lusts. That's what he's talking about. What's he going to say? He's lust. He says, you lust for what you don't have. You covet for what you cannot obtain. You mock God with prayers for vanities of life. You know, ask, receive not, because you ask amiss, as he says there. Because you're the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. That's the central focus of the people in professed, professed world. They willingly commit adultery with the world, seeking after the vain glories of temporal pleasure, instead of forsaking those things for a greater good. See, and, and then what happens in the end? These things bring them down to the dust in utter humiliation, and the very sin that they thought would humble them before God brings them the humiliation of a shame-filled life. But they're sinners saved by grace, right? Well, that's what they're taught. It's really the comparison that I can draw from this. See, in their state of ruin, anyone who offers them a lifeline to God and a sure way out of the mess that they're in, they don't like it because there's effort involved. See, that would mean taking the word on face value as truth instead of listening to their pastors and pundits continue to tell them that everything's okay and they can ride the happy bus to the end. See, they arrogantly thumb their noses then at the warnings and they shoot the messenger that brings it. 
But what real assurance do they have? I was talking about my, with this my wife today. What assurance do they have? Well, maybe it's their strength in numbers. Yeah, they've got everything on their side, that's for sure. But so does the devil. he got the whole world on his side. He holds the whole world in his sway, John says in 1 John 5. Well, maybe that's their assurance. Maybe their misery loves company. Or maybe it's just vanity of pride that they don't want to submit themselves unto God. I don't know. If, see, if they would really draw nigh unto God and behold themselves in that mirror, that eternal mirror, the shock would overwhelm their senses. See, they'd be able to understand then the depths of their double-minded ways in the impurity of their thoughts, in the resentment that they have towards God. By continuing to disobey Him and then look at His Word as though uh, it's not of works and uh, anybody that believes and all that other nonsense that they constantly quote, leaving all this other stuff left unsaid. Like I said, the caption in that passage I read said that humility cures worldliness. See, but only in the sense that a person submits themselves to God. This term submission, if you look it up, it's, talking, it's a military term, meaning to submit, put yourself in su to subjection to an authority that commands your obedience to it, like soldiers that would line up in obedience to their commander and go forth and obey his orders. That's what that word means. See, in God's service, there's no double-minded disciples. Like James 1a says, the double-minded receive nothing from God. In Matthew 5.24, you can't serve two masters. See, if you prefer worldly pleasures in the vain glories of the world over God, then you set yourself up as his enemy. That's what that word enemy means. It means you're his enemy. Just like an army would pose itself as an enemy. And you reap what you sow, the inevitable consequences of a sin-filled life, as we just talked about. See, James speaks of that self-cleansing humility that takes place in genuine repentance in that, in that verse we read, in the brokenness in the morning and the crying out to God and the sincere bid to get clear of your wrongdoings and come clean with God. You know, clean, cleanse your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts. That's what he's talking about there, coming clean with God. And that's what you, you don't do with the repeat after me routine. Nobody comes clean. Nobody ever stops doing their vile behaviors. In fact, then they learn to glory in those things and glory in their shame, just like the Scripture says. And then they call good evil and evil good. And, and anybody that comes with a righteous message is self-righteous and puffed up and an evil judge. And that's really what it boils down to. See, in the professing Christian world where the warning verses don't apply, and anybody that brings them is the devil, it's in their mind is, how much sin can I get away with and how much fun can I have before the Lord comes and takes me home? That's what it looks like they're doing and it's what it certainly appears to be. But the nagging doubt remains. It's like an empty void that can't be filled. And that's why they keep lusting after the world. See, why is your Christian life under this thing a train wreck of wrongdoing when God was supposed to clean you up when you received Jesus? Where's the abundant life? Where's the newness of life? Where's the promise of a renewed mind? Of this insanity of sinning all the time? Why can't you escape the corruption that's in the world through lust? If faith is the victory that overcomes the world, why are the professed Christians constantly overcome by the world and love it with all their heart and mind and go after it? That's all they talk about on the blogs. That's what the brothers tell me. On them blogs, it's all they talk about is their entertainers and Hollywood and, and the games and all that junk out there in the world that brings them nothing but more shame. See, logically, if the warnings don't apply, then neither do the promises. Just like James says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may consume and squander them on your own pleasures. That's what that word means in that, pat, that passage in James 1.3. See, that's why, you know, that's why it doesn't apply. See, you cannot have worldly gain and count that as spiritual riches because that leaves you empty and wanting for more. See, in the haze of worldly indulgence blinds your eyes to the one fact that God has stayed His hand of judgment on this obstinate and hard-hearted generation out of the kindness and patience of His long-suffering, giving them an opportunity to repent like Romans uh, 2.4 talks about. 
to come to their senses and, and, and reason and turn to Him and turn away from their, amend their ways and stop the evil of their doings and cease to do evil, learn to do good, those things. But nothing lasts forever. His patience is not going to last forever. Not in the realm of man. God has a timetable. And when it comes to sin, He's going to allow you to have a full measure of iniquity. Check out Genesis chapter 15, verse 16. Then the hammer falls, so to speak. Justice will prevail in the end. You'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. No matter what your pastors and your pundits and the past preachers and everybody that you quote and Augustine and Spurgeon and all the rest of those heretics, it doesn't make any difference. You're going to stand and give an account before God for things you did in the flesh, whether good or bad, and be judged accordingly because faith was supposed to work by love and purify your heart. See, if you go through this submission that James is talking about, it's going to bring humility and purity and peace, harmony, submission to God, yielded to God. That's what the wisdom from above is. See, the lies and the vain promises of men is not going to get you anything of value in this life or in the life to come. So you gain nothing on both sides. Just misery and shame here and then eternity hereafter. See, you contemplate how utterly foolish this is to defend your sinful lifestyle in the face of God's crystal clear warnings of love and you begin to understand how wretched these people all really are and how blind. So you shoot the messenger that brings you these warnings and scorn his comparison that he's making between these things and cast it away and just refuse to even listen. Well, maybe the happy bus ride that the professed world is on is going to last another hundred years. I don't know. Seems like we're in the last times and things are getting pretty bad. But it could. So the sin everyday people, maybe they'll die quietly in their beds with the pastor standing by, repeat after me and everything's going to be fine. And then the remaining people that's still on the happy bus out there, to nowhere. They'll continue to wonder then why those of us seem so compelled to insist on making such a big deal about all this sin that they're committing that's already been taken care of in advance by Jesus. And yeah, maybe that's the case. If that is, what's more can be said? Que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. The sinning saints, as they like to think of themselves, will continue to deny God's warnings, test His patience to the limits, but they're going to lose on both counts. Their lives are a ruination of sin here and will be destruction and eternal misery hereafter. They're convinced that God's grace gives them a special preference over the other sinners who have yet to receive Jesus out there in the world. So they go about their days in absolute complacency, willfully committing acts of rebellion against God's word and violating every form of decency that's known to man and naysaying anybody that cares enough to warn them in God's love. See, you don't understand love does not rejoice in iniquity, but in the truth. They think love is tolerating everything that comes down the road. That's not the case. These warnings are given out of love. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Read Ezekiel 18. See, the agape love, that everybody understands that word, the agape love of God, they should understand it by now in the church world, See, it's dispassionate. There's no malice or no hatred involved, neither with us, because that love dwells within us. See, a heart that is in tune with God is saddened by the lies and the hypocrisy of the people that call themselves by His precious name and live in sin and trample His name, trample the Son of God underfoot and insult the Spirit of grace. So we're compelled then by His love to persuade you that the way that you've chosen will lead you to perdition and destruction. That's what the Scripture says in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 5. For the love of God, Christ constrains us because we judge this, that if one died for all, then all died. Where you died with Christ, you crucified the flesh with His passions and His desires. So he goes on to talk about, you know, be reconciled to God. We're ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. That's exactly what he's doing. 
pleading through us that we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. See, reconciled means return to favor. And return to favor is reconciliation processed through repentance and faith proven by deeds to approach that mercy seat in the brokenness, in the self-cleansing humility of repentance and plead your case before God. And then the heart can be made pure. You want to be lifted up? God will lift you up, James said. You humble yourself in the sight of God and He will lift you up. You want to be lifted up on the plains? and walk with Him in newness of life, and have your heart cleansed and pure, your conscience purged of these dead things, your life a ruination of sin to be done away with, then that's the path you've got to take. It's not an easy one. Few shall find, strive to enter through the narrow gate, for many will try and not be able to enter. The Scripture says that's the gospel of Christ. Not the gospel of, it's not of works, least anyone should boast. We've been over that a hundred times before. No, it's not going to be an easy course for you that are addicted and immersed and entrenched in your sins. You are addicted. You are in a mindset of sinning every day, an insanity that's ruined your life. And the only way to come out of it is through that process, through that season of sorrow. I've seen people come out and it's a glorious, a glorious end to it that when, they, when they reach that point. And they shout for joy that God has redeemed them and raised them. And then they live in purity and righteousness and walk in worthy of Him and contend earnestly for the faith in this dark day in which we live. I've seen it a number of times. If you would like to see it a lot more. But I know this generation is given over to a reprobate mind. Many are seared beyond even thinking about being convicted by these things. And they just laugh and scorn and joke their way down the road to destruction. So I don't know if they could ever be reached. Perhaps with God all things are possible. But there is a timetable involved here. Just like I said, God's not going to stay His hand forever. Judgment is inevitable. And justice will prevail. Think about it. Again, come to my website if you need any information, the PDFs that you can click on and read, print them out, distribute to them, your little Bible study groups, whatever. Go over these things, dig, dig, and dig some more and find the truth. That's how I've seen people come through this mess. Those of you that are out there fighting in your little home study groups and, and uh, contending for the faith, trying to bring others to the truth, bring them. Know that it's a process. Be patient with them. If they have a sincere heart before God, they'll come through. They'll come out of it. If not, they'll leave. They'll depart. Just like that scripture says in, in 1 John, 1 John uh, chapter, I believe it's in chapter 4, where he says, uh, They are of the world, therefore they speak of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. And by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Not to be arrogant, but if they have a sincere heart seeking after God, then they're going to continue to seek. Pull them out of that fire. So don't grow weary in well-doing. For in due season you shall reap if you faint not. Don't give up.